Hello, my name's Tim Addy. I'm a philosopher, particularly attached to the Platonic tradition of philosophy, and hope over the next few months to make a few videos exploring different aspects of the philosophy of that tradition. But it's April 2020 and the world is in the grip of the coronavirus, uh, and it seems to me a useful thing to do at this point to think and talk about death, in the hope that if that's done well and philosophically, it will lead us to understand life a little better. After all, the exploration of anything must include finding the boundaries of that thing. For the Platonic tradition, the whole of reality is constituted of two distinct but related orders of existence. The first order, the eternal order, is made up of things that possess real being. They're eternal, they're intelligible, they're full of life and creative power. It includes all the ideas that underlie the second order, which is the order of material existence, the order of time. That order is a flowing order. It's full of things which, in the words of Plato, don't possess stable being, but are in a condition of continually coming to be. That second order and its contents is intelligible in so far as it participates of the ideas of the eternal order. And it lives because it participates in the impulse of light, life, which is derived from the first order. Sitting between those two conditions of existence with a foot, if you like, in both camps, is soul. It's worth noting that uh, the Platonic tradition recognises various kinds of soul, of which the human soul is but one but it's the human soul which concerns us today. The human soul has the task of transferring the vision of the ideas of eternity into the world of time to shape the little corner that it has influence over in the light of those ideas. For that reason, it has to have a perspective, a double perspective. It must be able to focus on the part, the arc of time, the little corner of the universe that it works in, and a perspective of the whole, the universal perspective. That view of the whole is obtained by looking carefully, exploring, the ideas that reside in eternity. For Plato, the natural condition of the soul is to possess that great vision of eternity. But the descent into body brings with it a certain forgetfulness. This is what Plato writes in the Phaedrus. Every soul takes care of everything which is inanimate and revolves about the whole of heaven, becoming situated at different times in different forms. While it is perfect indeed and winged, its course is sublime and it governs the universe. But the soul whose wings suffer a defluxion verges downwards till something solid terminates its descent, whence it receives the terrene body as its destined receptacle, which appears to move itself through the power of the soul, and the whole is called an animal composed from soul and body, and is surnamed a mortal animal. That's a fundamental tenet of Platonic philosophy, that the soul is the self, and the body and all its impulses is, if you like, its instrument. That's why it's viable 
when it's not in body as well as when it is in body. Here I am uh, and my invisible self wishes to convey these ideas but I'm only able to do it because I can move my lips and my tongue and pass breath across the vocal cords. So my invisible self tells my body to do just that. A single life is a tiny part of the experience of the whole. It's important that in we put the part in the context of the whole. A part torn out of the context of the whole becomes random. Its value seems to be accidental. It seems to be meaningless. Meaning is really taken from the whole. Some of the ideas that Plato seems to subscribe to can be traced back to the Orphic tradition. Orphic teachings and Orphic myths and dotted around the Mediterranean world are a number of graves in which gold tablets have been found. They date from Plato's time as well as before and these little gold tablets have words inscribed on, on them, which uh, modern scholars have called a kind of ritual texts, ritual texts for the afterlife. There is a kind of mantra, which clearly these Orphic uh, initiates were expecting to guide them through the twisting paths of life and death, there is a mantra which reads, I am a child of the earth and of the starry heavens, but my race is of heaven. Both Orphic tradition and the Platonic tradition see the path of the soul moving them backwards and forwards through life and death. Nobody learns the art of addition by adding the same two numbers together over and over again. A good arithmetic teacher gives to the child a, a varied number of particular sums to perform confident that the intelligence of the child will, by performing the particular calculations, arrive at the principles of addition. And again, the student of music is given by the, their teacher a, a number of pieces of music in a number of forms to listen to, on the understanding that eventually the student will come to understand the whole theory of harmony. To move from being a passive listener of various piece of, pieces of music to becoming a composer of music. And so it is with the soul. The soul learns the art of soul life by passing through a number of terrestrial lives passing through life and death. Death is a part of that path. Death is, therefore, as much a part of that path as life, as much to be greeted with joy as is a birth. Am I saying we shouldn't grieve when somebody we love passes from this realm? No, I'm not. Nor am I saying that we shouldn't look both ways when we cross the road. 
But when we grieve, we should soften our grief. That which is truly lovable about any human being is part of the unchanging world. That person's unique relationship with the good and the beautiful is unchanged, even though the scenery in which it is to be found has changed. The manifested world is beautiful and everything within it has its own beauty and its own goodness. And we should care for that portion of the world over which we have influence, adding to it our own measures. But it is impossible to do that well if we don't understand how that portion fits in with the whole. Nor can we do it unless we realise that a letting go is as much part of life as a taking hold. Once we gain the greater perspective, many of the oft-repeated clichés of our material world, our material culture, becomes questionable. For example, that someone has had their life cut short, or died before their time, that someone has not had the opportunity to fulfil their potential. All such affirmations presuppose that we know how that soul is going to unfold itself, that we know the path that it's taking through the twists and turns of life and death, and that a particular death has somehow prevented its progress. Each soul's potential is almost beyond imagining. What happens is we become bedazzled by the brightness and the immediacy of the life we're leading right now. We lose the perspective of the whole, not only for ourselves, but for our loved ones. Joseph Blanco White wrote one of the most beautiful sonnets in the human, in the English language. It runs like this. Mysterious night, when our first parent knew thee from report divine and heard thy name, did he not tremble for this lovely frame, this glorious canopy of light and blue? Yet neath a curtain of translucent dew, bathed in the rays of the great setting flame, Hesperus with the host of heaven came, and lo, creation widened to man's view. Who could have thought such darkness lay concealed within thy beams, O sun? Or who could find, whilst flower and leaf and insect stood revealed, that to such countless orbs thou madest blind? Why do we then shun death with anxious strife? If light can thus deceive, wherefore not life? Physical immortality is impossible. Whatever is born also dies. But the quiet acceptance of what is beyond our power to change leaves us to concentrate on what is in our power to change. There is an old Pythagorean saying, to live indeed is not in our power, but to live rightly is. Plotinus, in his treatise on the descent of the soul, talks about the danger that the soul descending into materiality engulfs itself in the darkness of matter rather than guiding lightly the body. This is what he writes. For it, the soul, now directs its mental eye to a part 
and by a separation from that which is universal, attaches itself as a slave to a part, to one particular nature, flying from everything else as if desirous to be lost. Hence, by an intimate conversion to this partial essence, and being shaken off, as it were, from total and universal natures, it thus degenerates from the whole and governs particulars with anxiety and fatigue, assiduously cultivating externals and becoming not only present with body, but profoundly entering into its dark abodes. Death is the medicine that the good universe offers to the soul which has fallen into anxiety and fatigue, into the forgetfulness of the light of heaven by its descent into the darkness of matter. I've called this video Life, Death, Life because recovered from an excavation in Olbia on the shores of the Black Sea uh, is a little polished bone tablet. It's clearly connected with the worship of Dionysus and like the Orphic gold tablets with the mantra of the child of earth and starry heaven, uh, it's um, Orphic in character. On this plate are written the words life, death, life, truth, signifying perhaps for us that truth is only be to be discovered by a path through life and death and other lives. Uh, below those words are two more words, Dionysus, Orpheus. The myth of Dionysus was that he was to become the sixth ruler of the universe. But before he could become so, he was taken down into a dark cave and torn into seven parts by the Titans. The parts were rescued and brought back together as one by Apollo, and the whole was brought back to life by Athena. And this is our myth, this is our destiny. Our consciousness is scattered, separated into material bits by our descent into body, but it is only by the light which is brought by Apollo and wisdom, the gift of Athena, that we recover our perspective on the whole. As I say, for Plato and his tradition, the soul is a viable thing, whatever condition it's in, in the body, with the body or outside the body. When an artist comes into the studio and approaches the canvas with her paints and brushes, then we can see she's an artist. But before she entered that studio, she was still an artist, contemplating what she was about to produce. And when she leaves the studio in the evening, she is still thinking about the work she has done. And even in the studio, sometimes she moves forward towards the canvas and paints and sometimes stands back and contemplates what she has done, what she has done well, what she needs to adjust and what is left to be done. So it is with the soul. It has a canvas, the material world upon which it works but sometimes she must labour on that canvas, in that world, and sometimes she must stand back. Plato calls the place 
where she is able to contemplate how she has lived, what is left to be done, what is left to be adjusted. Hades, that's not the equivalent, by the way, of hell. It's just a place where the soul stands for a while between earthly lives. The paradox is that in working on the world, in truth, the soul is producing herself. The soul shapes herself. The soul shapes her divine nature by her own powers through the cultivation of wisdom and temperance and fortitude and justice and all the other good qualities that it sees in the heavens. Death is not a tragedy. Death is not a tragedy. Death takes us and strips us of the costume we have worn to live a particular life. Whether that costume is the purple robes of an emperor or the dirty rags of a beggar or anything in between, it strips us of that. It throws away the possessions we thought were valuable. We are left without possessions and without costume and we are able to see what we are rather than the character that we've played. Intrinsic to soul culture is the Delphic exhortation to know thyself. If we're working on ourselves, if that is truly the material that we work on, we have to see it for what it is rather than what it appears to be. Death helps us do that. When death comes for you, or the ones you love, greet him cheerfully. You've met him many times before. He is a benefactor, just as life is. As nature unbinds the ties that bind the body to the soul, so you cooperate and unbind the ties that tie the, tie the soul to the body. These are bonds which last for a while and perish. But the Chaldean oracles, the oracles of the ancient world, tell us that there is a never ever, never ending binding, which is the bond of love, heavy with fire, which binds all things in the universe together. Those bonds remain. Let me end with one more poem. This is by James Morgan Priest, and it's called The Solar Bark. The soul is like a glad canoe upon a sea of sunlight gliding. Though crystal sprays its course bedew, no sail is set, no hand is guiding. What breeze can drive the solar broat? What hand direct where ways are boundless? They swiftest go who peaceful float. They wisest teach whose voice is soundless. The spirit needs no outward sign, no guiding star of earthly seeing. It seeks no port save the divine the gods beyond the sea of being.